let's see how quickly we can cover everything you need to know for GCSE Biology Paper 2 for OCR. This is good for higher room foundation tier, double combined and triple separate science. I'll tell you when some of the bigger concepts are for triple, but not what's for higher room foundation, as there's not a lot of difference, honestly. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge. Let's go. Organisms generally compete for food, water, space and other things like CO2 and light for plants, shelter and mates for animals. Interdependence is the term given to the fact that organisms can rely on each other for these things and they can form a community. Abiotic factors in an ecosystem are the non-living aspects, for example, light, temperature, moisture, soil pH, CO2 and O2 levels in the air. Biotic factors are due to organisms and things like food that's available, predators, prey, other organisms around, pathogens, breeding behaviour and more. We can use a quadrat to estimate the size of a population of an organism in an area by sampling, say, around 10% of the area, taking a mean and then multiplying up for the whole area. Using a quadrat with a transect allows us to observe how population distribution or density changes over a distance. A food chain shows the direction that biomass and therefore energy flows in an ecosystem from one trophic level to another. Producers are any organisms that use sunlight to produce biomass, that's usually plants or algae. Primary consumers eat the producers, that's herbivores that only eat plants, or omnivores that eat both meat and plants. Then predators, known as secondary consumers, that could be carnivores or omnivores, prey on these, and then we can have tertiary consumers as well. Apex predators, they're at the top of the food chain. They have no natural predator above them. Population numbers of all of these will fluctuate in an ecosystem over time. By the way, this food chain is possible. I looked it up. Bears have been known to eat foxes. A pyramid of biomass is a way of viewing a food chain which shows us how much mass enters the next trophic level, relatively. You need to be able to draw one on graph paper using numbers supplied in the question, and also calculate the percentage absorbed by the next level. As per usual, any percentage is equal to the bit divided by the lot times 100. Of course, it's always a pyramid, and that shows us that biomass is lost at each level, as not all biomass is absorbed or consumed into the next organism. Some is lost due to the organisms living for some time before being eaten by a predator, for example. They have to move, they have to excrete. It's also lost as water, urea and CO2. Food security is a big thing at the minute, especially in these uncertain days. Food is becoming scarcer due to increasing world population, changing diets, food being transported around the world, which requires huge amounts of energy, changing growing environments, the cost of farming, that's a big one at the minute, and conflicts. For example, around 40% of the world's wheat comes from Ukraine, or at least it used to. Farmers are constantly trying to find more efficient ways of farming, largely by maximising biomass input to crops and animals, while also reducing biomass lost by them. Fishing sustainably is also a big thing. If a species is fished at a greater rate than its breeding, then its population can disappear in those areas. One way of sustainably fishing is by having nets with holes that catch adult fish but are big enough to let the little ones out. These escape to then go on and breed. All life is carbon-based, which means that when organisms die, the carbon is recycled, which ultimately can be then used to make more organisms. One way, of course, is when CO2 is produced, which plants then use to grow. Bacteria also release CO2 due to respiration when an organism undergoes decomposition. Temperature and other factors can affect rate of decomposition. Water also follows a cycle. Rain falls, precipitation, then runs into rivers, then into the sea, then it's evaporated, and the cycle continues. Farmers utilise decomposition to produce natural fertilisers that can then be used on crops. It can also be used to produce methane gas to be used as fuel. Biodiversity is one of those buzzwords that's very much in vogue at the minute. Basically, it just means how many different types of organisms you have in an ecosystem. High biodiversity generally makes for a stable ecosystem, as organisms don't have to depend on one species for a resource, for example. Human development usually results in lower biodiversity. Such development also poses problems when it comes to waste. We're having to find more ways of disposing sewage, fertilisers, toxic chemicals, atmospheric pollution and more to reduce our impact on the environment. One factor is the land that we need for building, quarrying, farming and disposing of waste. An example of this is the destruction of peat bogs to make compost, which affects the habitat of many organisms and microorganisms. Burning peat also releases CO2. Deforestation, bad on a big scale, flattening forests reduces biodiversity and it's often done to create farmland. Plants can also reproduce asexually. 
as this doesn't involve gametes, the daughter cells will be genetically identical, so a clone of the parent is made by mitosis. An advantage of sexual reproduction, of course, is that variation occurs, which can result in organisms becoming better suited to their environments, so they're more likely to survive. However, an advantage for asexual reproduction is that only one parent is needed. So, for example, if a plant is on its lonesome, it can still reproduce in order for the species to survive. Examples of other organisms that can do both are the parasite that causes malaria and some fungi. Genome is the term given to all the genetic material in an organism. This code is stored in DNA, of course, which is a two-stranded polymer in a double helix shape. A gene is a section of DNA that codes for a specific protein. The Human Genome Project completed its initial goal in 2003 when scientists mapped out what every gene is responsible for coding. This is powerful because it can help us identify what genes cause diseases or inherited disorders. Genotype is the term given to what specific code is stored in an organism, while phenotype is how that code is expressed in your characteristics, what proteins are made and that affects your physiology. The monomers between two strands of DNA are called nucleotides, and they're made from a sugar and phosphate group. There are four types, A, T, C, and G. You don't need to know what the names are, but A and T always go together in the sequence, as do C and G. Every three of these bases, as we call them, are a code for an amino acid. The sequence is copied by mRNA. This copy is then taken out of the nucleus to a ribosome in the cell where amino acids are connected in the order needed, which makes a protein, the shape of which affects its function. They also need to be folded into the right shape as well. Harmful mutations can change a gene so much that it results in a protein being synthesized that doesn't do the job it's supposed to. We now know that some DNA, however, doesn't directly code for proteins, but influences how other genes are expressed. This is the realm of epigenetics, and it's completely changing the way that we view DNA. Some characteristics are controlled by just one gene, like colour blindness. These different types of the same gene are called alleles. Usually, characteristics are dependent on two or more genes and how they interact. But keeping things simple... Dominant alleles are those that result in a characteristic being expressed, even if there's another allele present, a recessive allele we say. If you have the alleles big B, little b for eye colour, big B being brown, little b being blue, you will have brown eyes. It's only when there's no dominant allele in this case that the recessive allele is expressed. So me having blue eyes, I must have the gene little b, little b. Big B, Big B, or Little B, Little B are homozygous genes, as they only have one type of allele, whereas Big B, Little B is what we call heterozygous. We can use a Punnett square to predict the probability of a certain phenotype. My parents have brown eyes, but they both have heterozygous alleles for eye colour. There are three different outcomes of these combining, with a 25% chance of making me. That's Little B, Little B, so I'm not so much one in a million, more one in four. Eye colour is by the by, but some alleles can result in disorders being inherited. For example, polydactyly, extra fingers or toes, is caused by a dominant allele, while cystic fibrosis is caused by a recessive allele. Even if two parents don't have cystic fibrosis, they could still be carrying the recessive allele, so their child could have the disorder. Human DNA contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, but only one pair of these determines sex. If you have XX chromosomes, you are female. If you have XY chromosomes, you're male. The expression of these genes affects every cell in your body, every aspect of your physiology. We can also make a Punnett square to show this. As you can see, there's a 50-50 chance of a child being male or female. Variation is a result of the genes inherited from an organism's parents and also environmental factors. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution claims that random variation in offspring will result in some being better suited to their environment than others, and so are more likely to survive and reproduce. Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, however, asserted that adaptation and variation is guided by DNA in response to a changing environment. This was scoffed at for a long time, but we now know there's some truth to this, thanks to the discoveries made in epigenetics like we mentioned. Bacterial resistance to antibiotics is largely considered to be evidence of Darwinian evolution. Bacteria divide, mutations occur, and inevitably a bacterium with an increased resistance will be produced. That's why we only want to use antibiotics when absolutely necessary. It also means you have to complete the whole course of antibiotics. If you don't, weaker bacteria will be killed off, but more resistant ones will still be there, and then they're able to reproduce and make you even more ill. 
If organisms are able to produce fertile offspring, we say they're of the same species. Tigers and lions have been known to make liger offspring, but as they're infertile, we don't consider tigers and lions to be of the same species. We can selectively breed living things with desired characteristics to enhance these. For example, breeding dogs to produce breeds like Labradors, Collies, and if you're into undesirable characteristics, pugs too. Advancements in biology mean that we can also genetically modify organisms if we don't want to wait for selective breeding to do the job, or when we can't actually achieve what we want to with it for good or ill. For example, scientists have genetically modified bacteria to produce insulin, which can be harvested and used to treat people with diabetes. Genetically modifying crops is a way of boosting their yields or nutritional value. For example, golden rice has a gene inserted into it that produces vitamin A. It was developed to combat diets in certain areas that were lacking in this vitamin. Other GM crops have been modified to be more resistant to diseases, for example. The process of genetic engineering goes as follows. A gene is chemically cut from the organism that has the desired characteristic. This is done using enzymes, for example, the gene from a jellyfish that causes it to glow in the dark. This is then inserted into a vector, like a bacterial plasmid or virus that, in turn, inserts the gene into another organism, say a bunny rabbit. But this must be done in the very early stages of its development, say just after the egg has been fertilised, as this is the only way that you can be sure that the gene will be present in every cell of the bunny as it grows. By the way, I didn't make up this example, this has actually been done. Making exact copies of plants is easy. Just take cuttings off a plant, plop them in the ground, and that does the job. You can also go the slightly harder route by cloning from a tissue culture. This can be helpful for preserving some species from going extinct. Cloning animals is more difficult, however. One way is splitting embryo cells up just after fertilisation, then putting them into surrogate mothers. Essentially, you're forcing identical twins, but you don't know exactly what you're getting until they're developed. If you have a fully grown animal that you want to clone, take the nucleus from one of its cells, say in its skin, then insert that into another egg cell. It's essentially now a fertilised egg. Shocking the egg jumpstarts the development process and it starts to divide. It's then inserted into another female's womb where it continues to develop. Carl Linnaeus classified organisms into kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus and species. A good mnemonic for this is King Philip came over for good soup. The binomial, or Latin name for an organism, is just the genus and its species combined. As time went on, it turned out that another level above kingdom was needed, domain. The three domains are archaea, that's primitive bacteria, true bacteria, and eukaryota. That's everything else, of course, with DNA and a nucleus in the cells. Archaea, by the way, are often found in extreme environments on the Earth. They can, therefore, be called extremophiles. CVD, cardiovascular disease, is an example of a non-communicable disease, as the cause comes from inside your body. Other examples of such diseases include conditions like allergic reactions and cancer. A communicable disease must be caused by a pathogen that enters your body that will cause a viral, bacterial or fungal infection. Back to non-communicable diseases though, obesity and too much sugar can cause type 2 diabetes. A bad diet, smoking and lack of exercise can affect the risk of heart disease. Alcohol can cause liver diseases, smoking, lung disease or lung cancer. Cancer is the result of damaged cells dividing uncontrollably, leading to tumours. A carcinogen is the term given to anything that increases the risk of cancer, for example the tar in cigarettes. Benign tumours don't spread through the body and they're relatively easy to treat. However, malignant tumours are when these cancerous cells spread through the body, much worse. BMI stands for Body Mass Index. It's an indication of how healthy a person's weight is relative to their height. Whatever number you end up with will put you into bands that determine if you're underweight, a healthy weight, overweight or obese. Communicable diseases are caused by pathogens. That can be viruses, bacteria, fungi or protists. Protists are single-cell parasites. They all reproduce in your body and cause damage to it. But viruses can't reproduce by themselves. A virus, in fact, is just a protein casing that surrounds genetic code that it injects into your cells, which causes the cell to produce more copies of the virus. The cell explodes and the virus goes on to infect more cells. Creepy, right? Measles is a virus that causes a rash and it can actually be pretty deadly too. It's spread by droplets from sneezes or coughs. HIV is an STD, or STI, sexually transmitted disease or infection, that compromises your immune system. That's called AIDS for short. It can also be spread by people sharing needles. 
Bacteria, on the other hand, release toxins that damage your body's cells, like salmonella in undercooked food or gonorrhea, another STD that causes a yellow discharge from the genitalia. Not nice. Fungi do something similar, like athlete's foot, while protists do all sorts of different things. For example, malaria is caused by a protist that burrows into red blood cells to multiply, then they burst out, destroying the red blood cell in the process. It's spread by mosquitoes, so we say mosquitoes are the vector for this disease. It's not only animals, though. Plants are particularly susceptible to fungal infections, like rose black spot. Purple black spots appear on the leaves, and then they fall off. Such infections can be treated with fungicides. Tobacco mosaic virus affects plants by discolouring leaves due to inhibiting chlorophyll production. Less photosynthesis occurs and that causes stunted growth. Our bodies are excellent at protecting us from these pathogens though, thank goodness. Skin is the first barrier to them entering and if they do enter your nose and trachea, they can be trapped by mucus. Acid and enzymes in your digestive system will destroy them too. If they still manage to enter the bloodstream though, white blood cells are ready to combat them. One type of these are called lymphocytes. They produce antitoxins to neutralize the poisons pathogens produce, and they also make antibodies which stick to the antigen on a pathogen, and this stops them from being able to infect more cells, and it makes them clump together. Phagocytes are then able to ingest them and destroy them. An antigen on the surface of a pathogen will have a specific shape. So that means only an antibody that fits it will neutralize it. If pathogens are unknown to the immune system, lymphocytes will start making all sorts of different shapes until one fits. Miraculously, your immune system will then store a copy of this antibody next to a copy of the antigen so it's ready to stop it from causing an infection next time you're exposed to it. You now have immunity. A vaccine is a dead or inert version of a pathogen, usually a virus, that exposes your immune system to the pathogen so it can produce the antibody without it infecting you. For example, the flu vaccine, you're injected with the virus that has been irradiated so the DNA has been damaged in sight so it can't do the job. Incidentally, the COVID jab, however, was intended to work differently. Instead, you're injected with the DNA, or technically mRNA, needed to trick your cells into making part of the virus, including the antigen. It was the first widely used jab that used this mRNA technology. This is a crazy one, monoclonal antibodies. These are made from clones of a cell which is able to produce a specific antibody to combat a disease. This is achieved by combining lymphocytes from mice with tumor cells and this makes a hybridoma cell. This is then cloned to produce a lot of antibodies ready to treat a patient. These monoclonal antibodies can also be used for medical diagnosis, pathogen detection in a lab, or even just identifying molecules in tissue by binding them to a dye. So they glow when grouped together because they'll be designed to bind to a specific molecule. The downside to these is that the side effects are turning out to be worse than scientists expected. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Quiz Shorts app to help you test your knowledge. And I'll see you next time.